invite Ms. Catherine Kennedy, the director of the Grace Kennedy Foundation, to introduce our lecturer. James M. Solomon is well known as an astute and influential businessman who has contributed much to the development of the Jamaica business community through his membership in the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, where he served as president for two consecutive terms. He was also a director of the Pharmaceutical Council of Jamaica and vice president of private sector organization of Jamaica. At a regional level, he was the president of the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce and private sector advisor to the CARICOM Regional Negotiating Machinery. He recently completed a two-year secondment to the Mona School of Business as executive, executive in residence. James M. Solomon is even better known for his close relationship with Grace Kennedy as a sign of one of the company's founding fathers, James M. Solomon Sr., and his own lifetime employment to the company. His role in the development of Grace Kennedy has been integral as he served as Executive Chairman of High Law and Medical Grace Limited, Divisional Director, International Business, General Manager, Grace Kennedy Merchandise, Divisional Director, Industrial Retail and Trading. And in June 1998, he was appointed Director Responsible for Corporate Affairs. More recently, he has developed a reputation as a man of strong opinions, who is unafraid to share those opinions, a man of principle, who stands by those principles, a man who loves his country passionately, who does not shy away from public service. These latter qualities have led to his being increasingly called upon to share his vast knowledge and ideas in the lecture hall, as a keynote speaker at various events, and as a columnist in the national and regional media. One of his most outstanding attributes is his ability to bring interest in the most dense and complex subjects. He displayed this most admirably when, while in the capacity of private sector advisor to the CARICOM Regional Negotiating Machinery, he undertook the mammoth task of informing the people of Jamaica on the impending CARICOM single market economy. When the lecture committee conceived of the idea of comparing the nation's growth path with that of the Grace Kennedy's 90 year development, we did not have to look far for the most appropriate candidate to undertake the lecture. He was here within the Grace Kennedy, and in fact, the Grace Kennedy Foundation family, Mr. James Masalma. The combination of Jimmy's knowledge of national affairs, his intimacy with the Grace Kennedy journey, and his analytical and critical thinking skills, all bolstered by his well-deserved reputation as an eloquent and engaging speaker, made him the ideal person to take on the research and writing of this year's lecture. Please help me welcome our 2012 Grace Kennedy Foundation lecturer, Mr. James Musal. Good afternoon, friends. I don't know who is the guy who's supposed to be speaking to, but I'm just ordinary Jimmy Ma Solomon. So, um, Catherine, thank you for that introduction. Um, and let me thank those of you who are here very much for coming out today to hear what it is that we'll see. It was an interesting journey. In mid-September, when I agreed to this challenging assignment, I immediately tried to find some template from similar comparisons, and I was really unable to access any useful models. Companies were compared, countries were compared, but I found no evidence of crossover in any wide range of economic or social development models. And therefore, as any other true Jamaican would do, I had to turn my hand make fashion. I therefore decided to start at what was a distinct turning point for the country and the company, namely the impending end of the First World War in 1917. Provided, it provided a convenient year for effectively addressing initial mindsets that would prove to be important for the country and the company going forward. For the country, it marked an opportunity for renewed worldwide trading and for the company, it triggered the events that would lead to the decision to close Grace Limited as part of the post-war restructuring, thereby providing an opportunity for the establishment of the Jamaican company, Grace Kennedy and Company. Three important events are mentioned early in this story. The first refers to an offer by Michael Grace, the manager of Grace Limited, 
to build a modern sugar factory in St. Catherine. A council the Gleaner and the Legislative Council referred to the simple proposal. The company would build a factory and receive all cane for processing and the planters would use their best efforts to maximize production and yields and advise the factory in advance as to what variety of cane was planted. They would receive a guaranteed price and a share of future additional profitability. Mr. T. H. Sharp of Spanish Town and a member of the Legislative Council urged the planters to accept the offer. Needless to say, it was not accepted. This was an early indication that factors outside of the pure business evaluation were in the minds of the plantocracy, and some of this, regrettably, was related to the plant's easy accessibility by small farmers and the loss of power and control by the larger estates. Secondly, following the death of Michael Grace, his brother, Dr. John Grace, arrived in 1920, and the reports of a welcoming reception for him revealed this quotation that would set the tone for a new company that would emerge in 1922. And I quote, we had a soda water company and a bank. The latter was helpful to the soda water business. We had some cane lands which were useful to the bank. I think for one very hectic month we ran a laundry. <laughs> to anyone coming to Jamaica for the first time, it looks like an undeveloped estate. It seems impossible that this could be so, and one would say that perhaps the onlooker is wrong. But it is not impossible if one remembers that it was only after the Spanish-American War that the American people discovered that in the southern states they had an empire at their doors. It is quite possible, therefore, that Jamaica has been neglected. The future of Jamaica lies with the development of the sugar industry, with the cultivation of larger acres in cane she will become the Emerald Isle of the West, and her future prosperity be assured. If this island exported as much as the Sandwich Islands do, the income from that would be 10 million pounds sterling, and it is not impossible for this island to do so. I rather wonder what my future in connection with this firm is going to be. I look into each department and see that each is perfect, and I wonder what I can do. It is quite different in my case from what it was in the time of my brother. The business grew with him and he could fit into every niche. It will be some time before I can hope to get to the position of esteem and affection that he occupied in your hearts. He continues, in Kingston, I have noticed that between 11 and 4, there is a breeze blowing, sometimes gentle, sometimes boisterous but always invigorating. I believe it is called the doctor. I hope I will be able to take a cue from nature and be able to occupy the place in Grace Limited that the doctor does for Kingston. I hope I shall always be stimulating and invigorating and seldom or never be boisterous." End of quote. Another quotation came later from Mr. Fred W. Clark of Worthy Park Estates in a letter to the Gleaner, he advocated converting rum production to producing industrial alcohol or ethanol as we know that, that could be used to run motor vehicles and avoid the oppressive taxes related to the production and export of rum. I quote from him, personally, I have no faith in the planters doing anything to help themselves. I can only conclude that due to the harassing circumstances under which they work, such as oppressive taxes, labor troubles, droughts, floods, fires, and unremunerative prices, we are suffering from what is called by the medical profession neurasthenia. I feel like this myself, but so long as I can kick, I will kick. This is from the Gleaner of March 15, 19. 22. Mindsets based on local prejudices and colonial norms of the country came into a sharp confrontation with the international outlook of Michael Grace, 
his brother, Dr. John Graves, brought an awareness of the wider world that would set an early opportunity for divergence in the company.